Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Perio Teaching and Learning meeting. Today is Wednesday, August 2nd, 2017, and I'm uh, one of the facilitators, the uh, uh, Neil Caden from the Perio Foundation, and our other uh, facilitators are not here today, but that's okay. Yeah, that's Tricia and Matt from University of Virginia. Um, so today the agenda is I pasted the agenda in the chat, the etherpad, so please feel free to sign in. I see people are. Thank you. Um, we're going to have our usual announcements. Um, we have a, our speaker, Andrea Novicki from Duke University, who's going to tell a story about uh, anonymizing grades and then open it up for discussion. If we happen to have additional time, we may, uh, there's other possibilities of things we can discuss, um, but we'll just see how that goes. Um, and we usually sometimes have a uh, have a JIRA that we review for Sakai. I don't see anything posted at the moment. If somebody wanted to volunteer that, that would be fine. But I think we'll just go through the agenda. And we'll start off by uh, uh, seeing if anyone has announcements. And I'll just, um, I'm curious, Wilma, if you want to make a pitch for the Sakai Virtual uh, Conference Committee? Sure. Yeah, um, we're actually having a meeting right after this meeting at 11 o'clock in room three. So um, if anybody is uh, interested in participating as part of the planning committee, we've just recently formed last um, last meeting was our first meeting. And uh, so we're really just getting started. It's still a great time to, to pitch in if you're interested. And um, it should be a lot of fun. We'll be putting together the logistics for the virtual conference that we usually Hold in the um, in the fall Novemberish time frame, so um, so that's at eleven today, and then also on Friday um, this week at ten o'clock um, Eastern in Big Blue Button, um, we're having a, a meeting for the Sakai Twelve Help documentation. So if you're interested in learning more about the um, the update for Sakai Help Docs for version 12. Uh, we do need volunteers, so anybody that has maybe an interest in helping document some of the new features, update the existing docs, it's a great way to learn about the, the new stuff in 12 <laughs> because you'll be going through it um, kind of, in, and we tend to break it up sort of by tool. Um, so if you're interested in helping to document a particular tool like lessons or uh, resources or something, so um, we're just going to kind of go over the process, what's involved, time commitment, all that kind of stuff. Um, so showing up to the meeting doesn't necessarily mean that you're committing yourself, but you can find out more information and see how to get involved if you're interested. Um, but we do definitely need some volunteers. And we're going to be um, probably uh, updating the, the 12 documentation very soon because we've been kind of been waiting for code freeze before we start doing a lot of, uh, of the checking through the existing documents. Uh, but once that happens, which should happen very shortly, then uh, it'll be a little more stable environment to work in. Um, so anyway, that's Friday at 10 a.m., also in Big Blue Button. Um, and we're in room three for the Help Docs meeting. Thanks, Wilma. Um, so let's see, does anyone else have any uh, announcements before I go through my list? Okay, so if you do, just uh, just speak up or put something in the chat. Um, I just want to mention that we do have a conference call page for this call, and we do have recordings of these meetings listed. They're actually on YouTube, but I just thought it would be good to share the link with kind of the home page for all the information about these calls and when they occur and um, who is scheduled to speak, who's uh, already spoken, and, and links to those YouTube recordings, which are um, available as well just directly on YouTube in the Aperio uh, in the Aperio area of YouTube, um, and there's even a um, what do you call a playlist for the for the videos. So that I'd mention that. Um, so a few things: the Kai Camp. Um, we're getting close to reserving a hotel for that January 21st to 24th in Orlando. That's uh, sort of unconference style Sakai 
uh, planning meeting. Um, we've, this is the third year in a row. We've had a lot of fun at the last two and really productive, you know, great work sessions, both technical and non-technical people. A lot of interesting ideas have sprung out of those uh, of those meetings, like, uh, you know, revived QA energy, um, Sakai marketing, which is um, grassroots marketing from the community, um, which is, as you can imagine, very challenging. Um, that's where it was pitched the Sakai inventory idea that Jolie's leading came out of that. Um, so just a lot of really good stuff, like I said, technical and non-technical discussions, usually around 20-ish people. And we also do fun stuff too. Um, there's a Sakai Camp Lite, which I haven't announced yet to the community, so this is breaking news. Uh, this came out of a couple discussions among several folks, both at LAMP Camp, which uh, the LAMP Consortium is a, a consortium of Sakai universities that share an instance of Sakai hosted by Longsight, and there were some of us there that had this discussion, and then it came up at the core team meeting uh, yesterday, development team meeting. Um, and uh, the way it's, and so I think Chuck Severance is gonna be there. Uh, Matt Jones, a prominent developer in Sakai is gonna be there. Uh, of course we have, uh, you know, Jolie is in uh, Duke and I'm here in Durham. So we've got already a good start. Um, and it's just a one day get together. Um, some folks are coming in for the All Things Open conference, which is in Raleigh. It's not related to Sakai, it's just about open source. I put a link there if you're interested in All Things Open. And then uh, that's Monday and Tuesday, then Wednesday, October 25th, we'll just have a one day you know, meeting to discuss whatever comes up. So just a one day get together. That's why I'm calling it Sakai Camp Light. It's not, you know, like a full Sakai Camp experience, but we've usually found that we, when we get several of us together, um, that we have some really, you know, helpful and robust discussions around different topics. So something to consider. Um, want to mention also that we're trying to get a presence at Eli, uh, which is the Educational Learning Initiative. Um, several of us went last year. Um, uh, several of us are planning going back, at least several of us this year. There's some, there's actually a cool presentation that Laura Geckler is working on for a panel discussion on NGDLE. So she's putting in a proposal. I think she's already got three different uh, women from the, from the Imperial community. Um, I imagine she's still open to having one or two more on that panel. So if you're interested in that, you know, talk to her and find out what that's about. Um, uh, so that's kind of different events that are happening. Um, Sakai 12, so yeah, as Wilma mentioned, we are getting very close to creating what we call a branch of Sakai 12. That's when we get really serious when features are frozen and we start getting into a more intensive QA effort. Um, our deadline was July 31st, which passed this Monday, and we are figuring that it's going to be another one, one and a half weeks or so, plus or minus a couple days to get ready for a branch. Um, so. I may put that announcement out there. Hopefully everyone saw it. Um, also mentioned that the rubrics feature, which is still, we're still planning on getting that done. It just is take, it's gonna take more work than the time we have to get it into 12 and we really wanna get 12 out. So rubrics is not going to be a feature in 12, but it will be a feature, you know, probably before um, summer of next year, of, of 2018, it'll get in there. But we still have a really compelling story, a lot of cool stuff in 12. Um, and also 12 related, uh, Didi Hurricane at uh, Marist College in Poughkeepsie has volunteered to uh, kick off a Sakai 12 planning meeting. A small group of us are going up to Marist College in Poughkeepsie next Thursday. We realize a lot of folks aren't able to travel to that, so we will have a virtual online component for those of you, and we're hoping a number of you will wanna help learn about Sakai QA or figure out how you can provide your ideas of how we can improve the Sakai QA process, either for onboarding new members or, um, you know, just improve the way we do testing. It's an ongoing challenge, but um, uh, usually we have a lot of fun and uh, find a way to make it happen. Uh, and QA is a really, really critical component of getting releases out, both in terms of the timeline and obviously the quality of, of the release. And let's see, is Tiffany on? She's not on, but I believe, let me check the calendar. Uh, Tiffany from University of, of Virginia has started doing uh, Samago test and quiz Jira triage, which is uh, going through existing Jiras that relate to uh, um, Samago bugs, sometimes features, and figuring out, you know, 
is it complete enough information on the JIRA? Is the priority correct? Is this a JIRA that we want to put community energy into? So just having general discussions around that. So I really appreciate that uh, community member taking up uh, taking up the mantle there to focus specifically on on uh, on testing quizzes because that's a that's an important area. So those are all my announcements. Does anyone have any questions or additional thoughts before we move on? Okay, so no questions. So I'd like to introduce uh, Andrea Novicki from Duke University to talk about anonymizing grades in Sakai. Hi, Andrea. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so I am a, my official title is Academic Technology Consultant, and I talk to faculty in the sciences about their teaching. And I had a conversation a number of months ago that I wanted to bring to this community. Uh, a faculty member in biology was teaching a class, and he had, like probably many of you have, had conversations about implicit bias and bias in the classroom and, and various issues like that. And he was concerned about how he was seeing his students through his own biases. So what he did in this particular class is all of the tests, which were done on paper, he had the students write their student ID number instead of their name on the paper. So that when he and his TAs, and he had several TAs, were grading the tests, they didn't know which student it came from. They could see the student ID, but they didn't, but because it's a number, it's not linked to a particular student in their minds. And he did this for several exams. He said it worked really well. He said the TAs liked it, and he said the students really appreciated it. That is that they were pretty clear on that he wasn't biased when grading the tests. And then he asked me, how come Sakai can't do this? So we know that tests and quizzes, that there is a way to anonymize it when, uh, when, you're, giving, when you're grading a test. But what he was curious about is what if the whole grade book was anonymized? What if it brought in, instead of student names or student IDs, it brought in the student ID number into the grade book and you had the option to, to or maybe that was the default, of just seeing the numbers and the student grades going in through tests and quizzes, through assignments, possibly through forums um, and other ways so that all the instructor could see were student ID numbers and then the grades. Um, and the idea is to avoid bias, of course. Uh, there would have to be some way of unmasking for individual students because a good practice, of course, would be for students who were doing poorly to have the instructor reach out to them. So you'd want to be able to do that. But if there was a way to use the student ID numbers for most of grading and for most of the accumulating of, of, of various things that are graded, that would send a message to the students that they may appreciate. Um, having that option available would also be a good way of communicating to faculty that there is bias for those who haven't been to all the workshops. Uh, so wanted to bring that particular idea to the community and I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. Um, if I may, this is Charles Bristow from Illinois State University. Um, can you hear me all right? Definitely. Okay. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure I see the utility in anonymizing the grade book because I tend to think of that as primarily I'm just entering grades in the grade book. I'm not actually grading when I'm when I'm putting the numbers in. Um, so I'm not sure that anonymizing the grade book actually gives you anything in that kind of area. Um, I like the idea of anonymizing grading. That's certainly great. And, and finding ways to build that into the tools where we're actually doing grading, I think, makes lots of sense, but I'm not so sure about 
actually anonymizing in the gradebook because most instructors want to be able to see how individual students are doing and looking for patterns or looking for you know places where wait this person isn't doing very well maybe i need to to have some kind of intervention if the gradebook is anonymous i can't tell who those students are um well thank you for your comments and i see your point uh and i think that you're you're certainly making a valid point that the gradebook may be the last place you need to be anonymized however i would say counter to that i've i've Two, two points, which I think are minor in the big scale, but I just want to mention them. And one is that uh, it could be that you're looking at grades in the grade book and you say, huh, I'm pretty sure that student would do better. And there may be some participation points or some way to look back at things. And I know that some of us may do that. So it's a way of getting around what is isn't a human practice. Um, the other thing is that I think that it would, you're right that we should be able to reach out to students who are doing poorly. And for that reason, I think we should have the ability built in to say, okay, for this student, I want to see who it is so I can email them and ask them to come and talk to me. And I, this is Jolie. I'm just going to comment, you know, chime in here because I, I, my impression of what Andrea was asking for too is that you should have the option. Now, certainly, yes. a faculty could say, "I don't want to see. I want to see these other tools anonymously, but I, you know, but I don't want to see this one anonymous." It'd be nice to have, you know, those kind of controls at the tool level, you know, to say, "Here's what I want to be anonymous, and, and maybe here's what I don't," or to, just a toggle within the gradebook to say when you want to see. Like at the end, I mean, obviously you have to submit your grades at the end, yes. yeah. <laughs> and you don't, and you know, probably um, depending on if you have some kind of integration with your with your student information system, it may be using those numbers anyway, and we'll be able to um, match students up. So even at that point, you might not need to to see, but um, you you would definitely want to have that control of whether or not when you see it anonymous and when you don't, and and so it's not sort of an all or nothing thing. Yes, I'd like to back up what Jolie just said, which is that that the faculty members should be able to override or maybe have the default be that it's not anonymous. Although I think there may be something to be said for having it be initially anonymous and they have and a faculty member has to change it so that they can see the names. But I I would like to see if if this was in fact an, an interesting idea for people. I think it would be useful if you could non-anonymize an individual name or all the grades as as an option. And um, it looks like we have a couple of comments. Yes. So Terry said, interesting thought, but how would you be able to encourage students in a learning community? Terry, I'm not sure I understand your- Okay, yeah, okay, I get it. Um, one, of, one of the goals of, of getting students engaged in a course is in building community. And if you anonymize things, especially if it's like a global thing, um, they, they get to know one, two, three, four, five, six, and not Joe Jones or Mary Smith or whatever. Um, a part, part of the idea that a lot of people have of online learning is this: you know, you're you're off in your little cubby here, and you're anonymous, and you don't have the social contact and social engagement with the people that you should be learning with, which is poor learning theory, and. Um, and in order to build community, you have to be willing to engage people and begin to know them and share ideas and get back and forth and all this kind of thing. But to do that with one, two, three, four, five, six is a whole lot different experience than doing it with Andrea and Jolie. I, I'm, I am really leery about the idea of a global anonymization. There should be um, the ability to have forums or wiki or the student pages or whatever so that you begin to know 
that uh, the kind of things that that Neil might come up with when he's talking or that you know whatever and um, and I think that's an important component of successful learning that gets lost when you try to forget who everybody is Terry, I think I think you've made an excellent point, and I was um, a little bit blindly, perhaps, thinking about this for face-to-face -face classes. I hadn't thought about the implications about using it for purely online classes, and I think you're right, and I think that's why um, I would not advocate for always having anonymized grading, that you would have the option to turn it off. It looks like Linda has a question as well. An anonymous. Oh, wait. Okay. oh sorry. It, it, sorry, the chat moved while I was reading. <laughs> anonymous grading is required by the American Bar Association for our law school classes. I think it is to remove any bias towards students from grading and, and involves TA grading. Okay, cool. So how does that work? How does that work? <laughs> Yeah, how do how do you do that, Linda? How do you accomplish that? It looks like Linda's on um, listen only mode, so she might have need time to chat to type in the chat. Um, okay. Linda, if you want to call in, I'll just paste the phone number if you feel like doing that. Let's see. So here's the phone number if you want to call in and explain it, unless you're just typing away furiously there. So while and, while Linda's responding, I noticed that Mark also asked, "Do you envision a toggle at the level of the gradebook item that swaps the username, something like that?" Yeah, actually, I don't. Oh. I don't I'm not <laughs> thinking about it as at the gradebook item level. I was thinking of it as at the gradebook individual level. Yes, that's what I. That, so I misread his his statement. Yes, and I was thinking that in in the one possibility would be that the default would be anonymous and then you would then it would toggle to the username for an individual or if you needed to have the whole grades you could have the toggle also be for the entire grade book or for the entire site are you also talking about courses that have large numbers of students in them if you have a course that has fewer than 10 students I don't think you're going to be able to stay totally anonymous and again I come back to the social component um, when you're talking about smaller seminar type courses or online courses that are under 10 or 15 people um, that's I'm not I'm not real sure that you want to set the default there because there are a lot of courses that fit that model and um, that could be just a major annoyance for some faculty who have to go in and turn on all those names. Well, I'm thinking that there would be ones with that you could turn on the individual names or you could just do one setting that says, make this course not anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're right about have the online courses. So that's not really what I'm talking about I'm talking about the ones that are mostly face-to-face -face. many of our faculty who teach face-to-face -face classes especially the ones who teach large classes the only thing they use Sakai for is grading they may do tests and quizzes online they may not but they basically use it for grading I don't know if that justifies a decision, a global decision, though. Well, I think that's why we're having this conversation. <laughs> right, I understand. I'm, I'm, I, I really wanted other people's input. <laughs> <laughs> so, very good point. Um, I'm, we're now reading Linda's comment. Yeah, I'll read it out loud because that way I'll get on the recording. So I'll just read it. Um, currently, Linda Beth writes, currently we can't use it because the law school assigns a single numeric identifier to each student at the beginning of the year, and all work is submitted using that numeric ID. In Sakai, you can choose anonymous in tests, but the system assigns a different numeric identifier for each exam and doesn't allow for imposing a static number for each student. That's exactly right. Ah, so that's another good. Yeah. 
for these kids. Yeah. I, th I think another issue, though, that I've run into when it comes to using um, a student ID number Early on in LAMP, we wanted to use student ID numbers as the sign-in, you know, instead of the email address. And that came up to some FERPA issues. And uh, the student ID number is not supposed to be broadly publicized because it's considered a privacy issue. So that's, yeah, it's not supposed to be out there. So you would need to come up with a different identifier than a student ID number. Because if somebody gets access to your student ID number, they can theoretically at least uh, get into your your billing information and, and your grades and all this kind of stuff. It's supposed to be a unique identifier for privacy reasons. Interesting. We have two different numbers here at Duke. Um, but I, I would imagine any kind of unique identifier it's assigned to you regardless of whether it's your net ID. We have a net ID, we have a Duke, yet, um, Duke unique ID, which is just a number, and then students also have a, a student number. So I think there's, there's maybe three. And I, I would assume that any of those that uniquely identify you could be used against you <laughs> somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, um, I, it's, it's hard to see a way around, around that. Right. Uh, and unless you only display to students um, just a name, right? Um, and so, you know, what students see and what faculty see could be two different things because faculty will need to see more than students um, just to be sure that if they have two Jane Does in their class that they make sure that each one gets the correct grade because there's a way to uniquely identify those two people. Yeah, the idea of privacy is kind of a, is kind of interesting in the whole process as well. Um, we had a kind of a funny side. This is Neil. We had a funny side conversation at Lamp where uh, Dr. Chuck uh, Severance was saying biometrics are a complete waste because uh, once somebody has your thumbprint recorded digitally or your eye retina scan, they can just use that over and over again. And there's no, you know, actually passwords which are hashed and encrypted are more secure. So it's a totally tangential. Right. Uh, discussion, but yeah, but it's also this Terry a law of uh, unintended consequences, you know, like yeah, you think you're simplifying things, and it ends up being much more complicated down the down the road. So I'm curious, uh, and Andrea, if. Uh, how is I, I I'm really inspired that the faculty member was taking that much care um, to try and be as fair as possible with the students. I think that's really you know really cool. I'm curious if you've had other faculty also expressing a similar type of interest, or is this the first one you've come across? Uh, hi Neil, this is the first one I've come across. Uh, but my faculty tend to go off and do uh, because I work with science and scientists and engineers. They tend to go off and do all kinds of things that I find out about later. So it's, I don't really know. And I wonder for him, I did not ask him, but I wonder for him if he was concerned mostly about his TAs grading the tests and not really himself. So I'm, I'm not really sure where the observation idea came from. And certainly, because TAs are very often, this is their first time teaching, they're just out of undergraduate school and they're, they're each grading an exam, it's hard to train them all at once to be fair, just as it's hard to train all of us to be fair. <laughs> So did we miss any comments or did we get every everyone? Does anyone have any additional comments or thoughts? I'm curious, I guess, just uh, if you could very quickly, like in the chat, if you um, are 
interested in further pursuing the idea, maybe put a plus one. Not that you're absolutely in favor of it, but just like, yeah, you want to keep exploring. If you're kind of neutral, maybe do a zero. And if you think it's a bad idea, maybe a minus one, just to get a poll, like a sense of where the group is that's on the call. <laughs> yeah, you can, right. <laughs> That's funny, Terry. So, Neil, I don't know if this is helpful, um, but, you know, just even having this conversation, we re uh, revealed that another school is doing this and, and doesn't have a good way to do it. Um, and I know that we've had conversations fairly recently about um, anonymizing in the grade book. Um, I think maybe that's related to something Notre Dame's working on, I think. And then, you know, we already have these sort of anonymous pieces in um, tests and quizzes and forums. Would it be helpful to create a confluence page about this and let people know that it's out there if they wanted to comment on it, just to kind of raise the visibility of this conversation to see if other people are doing this and just it hasn't come up so my my so my initial thinking is and so noticing more things coming in there cool um my initial thinking jolie is if that's what you want to do just do it i tend not to want to be like the gatekeeper for discussions um i don't know how much interest you would get in the confluence page but i don't know that it would hurt so yeah, I mean, if that's what you want to try and do and see how that works out, that would be totally cool. I where I thought you were going with that is kind of reaching out um, to people you know of that seem like they're interested in this topic and kind of get together to discuss with them. Um, you know where that might go, if anywhere. It does seem clear to me, and it sounds like it's also clear to, to you um, that if something like this was done, it would be very important to make it an option and not a requirement in whatever you know workflow there was. Um, and Sakai tends to be, the community tends to be, in general, I won't say absolutely, in general, pretty open to features that can be turned off by default, right? And that an institution and or uh, site level can be controlled that way. Um, that's why we have this huge properties file and, and all those options. So those are just my initial reactions to that idea. So short answer is sure. If you want to try that, I, I don't have any problem with it. Great. And I want to say, this is Andrea, I want to say thank you very much for uh, the time to talk about this. And I really appreciate the things that other people have brought up that I hadn't thought about because I was so focused on my own context. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Really appreciate, appreciate you bringing this up to the group and generating a discussion. Uh, that was really cool. Um, looks like a couple more comments to see. Linda Beth, since it would only apply narrowly to one of our schools, we would definitely want this to be an option and not a default. Yeah. So any any final comments on this? I guess we'll just do a quick quick round robin. Um, you know, Charles, Jennifer, Julie, Laura. You can put in chat if you don't have anything more, but just check and see if anyone has anything more before we wrap up. Linda, Mark, Sean, Stephen. Okay, cool. It looks like uh, nobody has anything more on this topic, so um, we'll move on. And uh, Andrea, you're welcome certainly to stay if you want um, or to not stay. Um, so uh, we could do a couple different things. We could either just uh, adjourn a little bit early today, which I'm sure people are always have good use for time locally to, to um, put that extra time to use, or something we often do in these meetings. Oh, I guess one thing that would be a good thing to spend time on that is to see about a um, future topic. So that's probably worth putting at least a few minutes on. And then um, I, then then we could talk about, you know, whether we want to use this time just to end early, or oftentimes we use we go through teaching and learning types of issues in JIRA uh, using this time. We could certainly do that. So, but let's start, let's start with the um, ideas for future topics. Does anyone have any topics? And I think, uh, the model Andrea's presented is a really nice one because sometimes people feel like this obligation to do a big PowerPoint presentation and and um, you know have a number of slides, um, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be something like just bringing up an issue that 
um, you're finding is is uh, you have some curiosity around or you're encountering in your institution and seeing uh, what others think of it. So any thoughts for future topics, either for yourself that you have a particular idea or something you're, you would like it if somebody else brought up? Or other tools in Aperio that you'd like to see come back and have discussions with? Because we tend to be a little on the Sakai heavy side on this call, but not not in, not exclusively. And in fact, the next one, so right now we have August 16th is open, September 6th is open, and September 20th, we have an, one of our Atlas Award winners from Aperio, Writing 270, composing the internship experience, social media and digital discourse, uh, Denise Kummer from Duke University. Okay, well, if nobody has any thoughts, uh, or if you do, don't have any thoughts at this moment, but you come up with any, please send a note to the uh, teaching and learning facilitators, uh, one or more of us, which again is myself, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Tricia Gordon from University of Virginia, or Matt Bird just from University of Virginia, and let us know so we can uh, kind of investigate or put ideas out to the community and, and see what topics are of interest, so, uh, so thanks. Um, and then finally, I guess for this meeting, uh, quick poll, would, prefer, would people prefer to spend the remaining time uh, going through some Sakai teaching and learning issues in JIRA, or would you just like to end early? Terry would like to look at JIRA. JIRA, cool. Great, all right, well, since at least a few of us would like uh, to look at JIRA, we'll go ahead and shift the discussion over to um, teaching and learning issues that are in JIRA. If, for those of you who don't wanna stay on, you're welcome to, to leave early, but um, yeah, it looks like there's some energy around that, so that's super. So I don't have anything prepared, but we can easily um, get into JIRA and find those issues because we have them nicely tagged. All right, so what I'm going to do is create a new search. And we have a category for Sakai. Right now we have, um, eventually we're going to just have one Sakai project, just as an FYI. But currently in JIRA, we have a Sakai project, a lesson builder project, a kernel project, a Samago project. So a couple of our areas of Sakai have separate projects. So I use category. And then we have a nice little label here. L for teaching and learning. And then I just pull up things that are not already resolved. Well, maybe we'll do it by priority. That might be a cool way to do it. The blocker issues come up top. Priority project. So typically, component is where we put things like, uh, if, Sam, if Samago, for example, didn't have its own project, then that would be a component. And we'd say, okay, project, you know, okay, project Sakai um, and component uh, test and quizzes, which one day we will be there in not too distant future. So here's the JQL query if you want to use it yourself. So there are 62 issues in here. Um, it looks like some of them are critical Priority. That's what this arrow with a little dot underneath of it is, and um, and so and then there's uh, major priority. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go down the list. But what I encourage, I'll th actually I'll encourage people to take just a minute now, literally a minute, just to peruse the summaries. And if there's an issue that particularly interests you, um, maybe paste it in the chat. And that I think that would be kind of more fun than just picking random issues out, is to is to look at issues that are of interest to at least one person on this call. So your time starts now. I'll give you a minute. So there might be a minute of awkward silence here, or I can fill it in with, with uh, random chatter. Maybe. <laughs> I'm going to look myself and see if there's anything that looks interesting, that would particular interest to me.
Uh, okay, I see one that, that for whatever reason particularly interests me. So I'll mention this one, see if there's others that have the same interest. I'm not sure if this one, the discussion has ended or not. Um, since it's open, I'll assume not. But that one's on assignments peer review not available after evaluation period ends. So um, that one, for some reason, strikes me as an interesting one. Particular. There's several here that I know we've had some discussions on before. So does anyone else, so the minutes passed, does anyone else have any other? Feel free to put in the chat just any issue that, that looks interesting to you. Otherwise, I'll just start with that one and kind of start going down lists. No one's put anything in yet, so I'll just start on this one, and then we'll see if others emerge. Um, so you see it has the TNL label. It looks like this is one that has been an interest of Duke and Notre Dame. Um, let's see where the discussion ended. Uh, it might be that this is already determined to be a bug um, that people want to work on. So it says, once a student reviews another student's work and assignments using peer evaluation, that student review is not available after the evaluation period ends. A student does not have a way to, to view the peer review. So I think the conclusion on this one is that that is a bad thing that um, even after the peer evaluation period is over and the other students have reviewed, let's say, your work, and that's closed, that it seems like it would be valuable for you to continue to be able to see that that those uh, that feedback. I think that was the conclusion. Does that sound like the right feedback? And is that the right direction for, for that this issue? Sorry for my creaky chair there. And as an FYI, there does not seem to be a con contributed patch for this one yet. So I look over here in the Git source code. We have a connection with Git. So Terry writes, says there is no location to review. Perhaps that is key. Oh, do you mean, Terry, that there needs to be, there might need to be some additional screens created in Sakai as a place to which students can go to look at their reviews? Yeah, that's what I was reading there when it says right there at the end of the test plan, it says, uh, you're moving the screen. Sorry, I was trying to um, find the test plan. It says, after evaluation period ends, go back into assignment as student. There's no available location for the students to view the reviewer's comments. So if, if there was a page that stored those things, comments, then that might be the easiest solution. I, I, I think. Being, not being a developer, but that seems when you want the assignment to be closed, but you need to have a place where the student can go back and look at those comments. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me, Terry. And it's making me think that in a way it can be looked as a, as a bug, but another way it can be looked at as a feature request. And certainly the kind of work that that type of thing would, would need to add into it would be adding in new functionality, right? So this would become more of a feature request uh, than a bug. Yeah. And then, the, and then the question is, can we get the resources to, to address that? Yeah, and how complicated would it be? Right. Charles writes, I think that should be something the instructor could toggle as a setting, allow students to see peer review. That's a good point, uh, yes, Charles. Good one. What's that? That's a good one. Yeah, I think that's a good one too, Charles. Would you mind putting that on the, uh, Charles, would you mind putting that comment on the, on the, on the ticket? Sure, I'll need to get in, in there to find it, but. Right. I put the link in the chat, so that might help. Oh, just a matter uh, of yes. Yeah. yeah. Any other any other comments on this one?
Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, of course, the, the issue is always there to put comments on and, and just want to encourage everybody that that's what comments are for. It's totally an open process. So all you need is a JIRA account, which of course, if you don't have one, is free to make one and, um, and free and easy to make one. And if you're not sure how, please ask me and then uh, you know, feel free to put comments on JIRA. So, Charles, I think you've got a little bit of background noise. I'm going to mute you. Is that okay? Fine. All right. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to go to another one. So uh, I haven't seen any additional ones come in, so I'm just going to go from the top. Let's see. Sometimes tests don't submit when user timer runs out. Let's see here. Yeah, oh, you know what? It just occurred to me after this one, I have another idea for how to sort these that might be useful. OK, anyway. Um, we're experiencing an same ago 3221. We're experiencing an intermittent issue with tests that have a time limit. Time test should submit when the timer runs out. But since I'm grading from 29 to 11.2, we're seeing cases where they do not and remain stuck in progress. On a recent test taken by 35 students, two did not submit when the timer ran out. I've seen this problem on five different tests and five different sites since late April 2017. Attached is a screenshot of test settings from one of these tests. Also attached are log files for two students from the same test as in the setting screenshot, one where the test submitted when the timer ran out, the other one it did not. We have not been able to reproduce the issue, replicate the issue, or determine a common denominator. Looking at log files in some of the problem cases, we can see that the user logs into Sakai on another device while taking the test and or reviews past tests. However, we can see these same actions for users whose test did submit when the timer ran out. These occurrences are hard to detect. Either the instructor or student has to notice it and report it. And the academic impact can be high when unnoticed. The student is likely to receive a grade of zero for unsubmitted tests, which they actually took. That does seem like a pretty important issue. There's a bunch of a few comments on here. So right now, just I'm, I'm reading it. I assume other people are kind of reading the ticket. It sounds like there's a workaround, which is why this might not be a blocker priority. <clears throat> Let's see. Out of the box, Sakai has a default logic problem. Late submissions by default erroneously prefills the date on editing settings with the current date time at which the settings were opened. Oh, the prefills, yeah. Your current default is not to allow late submissions. I'd recommend keeping it for now. That said, default settings should not affect the date settings or of an existing or imported exam. So, talking about importing sites, importing tests from other sites. Didn't exist at the time of the original assessment's creation, will not be available to select a duplicate setting. Okay. So, that sounds like a, a, a challenging bug and an important one. I'm not exactly sure why the TL label was put on here, whether it was just to give more visibility to this, to the teaching and learning community, or maybe like if you're having, if you're noticing this at your institution and can provide 
you know, maybe some more clues to why this is happening. This clearly looks like a, you know, uh, important bug to get resolved. Does anyone have any comments on this? Thoughts as to its priority, workarounds? <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's see. Now I just recorded my Evernote screen on uh, onto a for this. Terry writes, I think it'd be a very high priority. Yeah, me too, Terry. I just it seems very challenging too though, because of the intermittent nature and sort of lack of clear set of parameters that trigger the uh, problem makes it especially hard when we can't when the team can't reproduce an issue it's really uh, hard to know what to do with that and oftentimes those do not get uh, attention or require extra community um, you know kind of effort okay well if there's no other issues another other comments on this issue we'll just move on um, kind of I'm thinking well anyway maybe uh, maybe we should skip the Samago ones because there is a Samago triage uh, process now on Friday's led by Tiffany. So let me go to the next one. This is interesting because it's a feature request and I'm not sure what this one is. And then we have time for probably just this one and then we'll... Okay, thanks, Laura. I appreciate it. Laura is saying that same ago triage will tackle those on Friday. So we'll just skip the same ago ones. So moving on to the uh, start end date ones. Let's see, this is for syllabus tool. New start end date. New start end dates are not clearly tied to calendar functionality. New start end dates have been introduced as a Kai syllabus tool that apparently address a use case where syllabus items can be added to the schedule tool. However, the association of the dates with the calendar feature is not evident in the current UI. <clears throat> Rather, these dates appear prominently to the right of each syllabus item in the default window and can be edited whether or not the associated item. Hold on a second. I got a cough. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just muted myself. Uh, let's see. I propose, however, the association rather right, these dates appear prominently to the right of each syllabus item in the default view and can be edited whether or not the associated item has been added to the schedule tool. In this case, these dates serve no function that I can discern. I propose that these dates only be visible if when the option to add a syllabus item to the schedule is selected and then just show the dates when editing the syllabus. In any case, I believe that way too much emphasis is devoted to these dates in the current UI. So I probably would appreciate a screenshot, although I can visualize the syllabus because I've seen it a number of times, and I, I'm pretty confident I know what Trish is discussing, although I'd still think a screenshot on here would be pretty good. The other thing that comes up for me just thinking about this is I think there's been sort of a number of side conversations, um, I think, in the community about whether we want to really put effort into improving the syllabus tool or whether we want to find ways to replace the syllabus tool like, for example, using lessons and creating some sort of template for the lessons tool to act as a syllabus. So, so there's a bigger uh, potential discussion, although at the moment I'm not aware of anybody who's actively working on, on replacing the syllabus tool with lessons. Um, but the other, the other advantage of that, just to you know, keep my thought process going here a little bit, is um, I think the fewer tools we have in Sakai, the better we can maintain and uh, the slicker we can make them. So that's something else to consider. Terry writes, now that Lessons has collapsible sections, the syllabus tool becomes more redundant. Either Andrea and Joe Lee or both of them uh, said that. And Stephen writes, they're hiding the syllabus tool in the next upgrade. So that's some confirmation of some of the things I've been hearing. And Laura writes, they hit it last year at Notre Dame. Hmm. No one used it correctly. We're trying to. Andrea and Jolie, and we were trying to get people to use lessons instead. Bingo. So 
I'm curious. That seems like that might be a fruitful discussion. This could be a Sakai camp discussion, or it could be a broader community discussion if anyone wanted to lead it. Oh, and Laura writes, they just post a PDF of their syllabus there. Yeah, that's another way of doing it, Laura. I assume that's something that's very, very common for syllabus is people just posting a PDF. And Andrea and Jolie said, yeah, we saw that too, Laura. So, um, so if anyone on this call is interested in taking uh, a role in like trying to lead a discussion on that or create a confluence page, I'm, I'm happy to provide support in terms of, you know, getting something set up. Um, so just curious if anyone wants to step up to that. Because it seems like SSSADADUF. Many of our channels, which many of our faculty will also just post a PDF or Word document. So I think that could be, you know, that could be really an interesting discussion because again, if we can get rid of the more tools, like it's great to add a new functionality to Sakai and there's some great new tools that have been coming in in functionality. On the other hand, the more code we can sort of get rid of in Sakai, the better it will, uh, you know, the easier it is to maintain, as I was saying, and, and make it a smoother experience for the tools that are supported. August 16th, what's that about, Terry? That's the next open meeting. Oh, yeah, sure. Is anyone willing? I think, in my opinion, it probably shouldn't be me leading it, per se, since I'm not really using the tool. I don't have faculty I'm supported that I'm supporting. Um, so does anyone volunteer or a couple people to do a panel and have an open discussion about, uh, you know, replacing uh, the syllabus tool by using lessons or some other strategy? And if you're not sure and want to write me off list, that's, that's fine. So, okay, I'll write that down tentatively as our, our August 16th discussion. That would help to have uh, some volunteers to lead that discussion. It, it would probably help to just have a few provocative questions to kind of let it take care of itself. That's a great idea. So if you have some idea, we can start brainstorming. Let's spend a couple of minutes brainstorming those provocative questions, and then that would be a good way to end the meeting, I think, for today. So lay it on me, provocative questions. I'm thinking. OK. Do we need a syllabus tool as a provocative question? A discrete syllabus tool, you right. know, one that's separate from. Yeah. As opposed to using existing tools, other tools. Like resources or lessons. Um, I would, before I say resources, I'd say wiki. Okay. Well, that would bring up a whole other... Oh, dropping off. Okay. Oh, right, Wilma, because we have the next meeting. Yeah, I'll see you there in a couple minutes. Right. We've got to wrap up because I'm also on the next meeting. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So p send your questions to me, but that does open a can of worms a little bit and that we've looked at, um, you know, our, our wiki tool is sort of an old style wiki tool and we're having trouble maintaining it as a community. And we've looked at alternatives in the past and um, that's a whole other discussion. But yeah, we'll certainly put it up there and we can have that discussion. How do professors post syllabi? How can we improve their air? Uh, Linda Beth writes, our provost has, what's the original purpose of it? Okay, that's great questions. If people could continue um, kind of throwing these all through Stephen's idea on here, keep throwing the ideas up here and that would be great. I think if we, I'm happy to facilitate if we have a bunch of questions we can ask people and start the discussion. That's really cool. Which tools in Sakai may no longer be necessary? That's another angle on it, Laura. Thank you for that. That could spin off another discussion. And let me see if I can get Linda's. And then we're just going to have to sign off here in like just a couple seconds. Our privilege is mandated. Our faculty have a copy of the syllabus in their course for the fall. Uh, since most people use syllabus tool for this, we can run a report against the use. Oh, OK. That This will be difficult to do without the tool. Oh, I see. How do we how do we track who's actually using the syllabus? Institutions track how well broadly. Okay. All right. Well, I gotta run. Um, but thank you for those questions, and that sounds like a great topic for next time. So uh, I'm gonna stop recording, and thank you everybody, and talk to you next time. Take care.
拜。